All right, it's 9 a.m., so let's get going. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the opening session for the Kronos Spoffs. Uh, we have a whole day packed full of fantastic material for you. This first session is where we're going to go through the highlights of everything Kronos in fast forward style in around 45 minutes. So it is going to be, well, it's going to be fast and it's going to be forward. So uh, hang, hang on there. So the, um, hopefully this is going to give you a good overview and may even inspire you to uh, come back to some of the more detailed sessions during the day. We have GLTF at 10, WebGL at 11, we have OpenXR at 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. There's a whole series of Vulcan uh, sessions. And then last but not least, we have a 5.30 networking reception where there's beer and pizza. So, and everyone is welcome, so uh, please come along. And all, all of the slides you're going to be seeing today are going to be posted publicly in the next one or two days. So I'm sure most of you have heard of Kronos, but for those that haven't, uh, who, who is Kronos? We are a standards organization. We are an open consortium. Anyone can join. We are committed to open and royalty-free standards for the industry to use. There are many standards organizations uh, around the industry. Our particular focus are standards that let software developers access the power of accelerator silicon. 3D graphics, parallel computation, vision processing, increasingly machine learning. So if you are developing uh, forward-looking applications that need hardware acceleration, uh, hopefully the APIs we are building can be of good use uh, to you. These are some of the most active standards that we have in Kronos uh, today, and they're grouped in terms of functionality. But the ones that we're going to be talking about in this session are OpenXR, because uh, we have just launched OpenXR 1.0 here at SIGGRAPH. Uh, we're going to be giving you an update on Vulkan, the new generation 3D graphics API, um, and along with Spear V, which is a central part of the uh, Kronos ecosystem, including Vulkan. Uh, we're going to give uh, some updates, a special extra package, a couple slides on OpenCL and OpenVX that aren't going to be covered anywhere else in the day, but uh, if you need more details on those, come and talk to us later. Uh, an update on WebGL, but not too much, because we have all the WebGL experts about to speak directly after me. Uh, GLTF, which is um, a 3D file format that's getting a lot of use in the industry now. And last but not least, we've announced a brand new working group uh, here at SIGGRAPH, so new we don't have a logo yet, uh, the 3D Commerce Working Group. So we're going to give you an idea of what that's about as well. All right, so let's dive in. OpenXR. By X, we mean um, augmented reality and virtual reality. X equals A plus V. And OpenXR is a cross-platform, high-performance, API for accessing uh, XR hardware and devices. We have today a, a classic fragmentation problem in the industry. Uh, lots of cool XR hardware out there uh, with their cool runtimes, but they all have different APIs for the programmers to access that runtime functionality. Uh, so uh, we've at Kronos created OpenXR where the industry has come together. All of these HMD and runtime vendors have agreed on a common cross-platform API that they can all expose into their runtimes. So applications just have to write once and then they can run on any hardware that supports the OpenXR standard. That's what we've announced and released here at SIGGRAPH. There's another API coming, the Device Plugin Interface API, which lets hardware vendors, if you're doing, for example, a special hand tracker or body tracker, uh, the device interface is going to let those hardware vendors write their own XR drivers and self-integrate into OpenXR compatible runtimes. That's going to come in a subsequent release. 1.0 is the application-facing uh, API. So, it's been the result of over two years of design effort from some of the best people in uh, over 20 companies involved in augmented reality and virtual reality to create this specification. But it's not 
just the working group. We released the provisional specification at GDC at March, and thank you, uh, all of you who gave us good feedback. The community feedback actually did have a significant impact on the final spec. Uh, we improved a number of aspects of the final standard, so I really appreciate the feedback uh, that you gave us. But the 1.0 spec is here. It's available on the website. Uh, it was released on Monday. But our work hasn't finished. We still have to finish the conformance test suite. We're almost there, um, but uh, watch out for that too. But as well as the spec, we have shipping implementations. As normal with a new standard, some companies want to be there on day zero. Some are going to roll out once the specification is finalized. But it's great. We have two implementations that are already shipping uh, just two days after the spec is finished. Microsoft are shipping OpenXR on their, both their mixed reality VR headsets and the HoloLens 2. And even more exciting, Microsoft are saying they're going to be diving into extending uh, OpenXR for some advanced AR functionality. They've stated they want to have all of the awesome HoloLens 2 functionality, like hand tracking, eye tracking, spatial mapping uh, as OpenXR extensions before the end of the year. So as we may have got to the 1.0 milestone, but there's a lot of uh, good work coming very quickly. Also, Collabora have released an open source implementation of OpenXR, and that's also uh, shipping today. If you look at the, the web, um, you'll see the press release. Uh, a whole bunch of companies have expressed support. Um, the Oculus family, you know, Epic, have announced specific deadlines for when they're going to be uh, shipping. And you'll see hardware vendors ship out their OpenXR drivers you know, over the next few months. This is uh, a full logo field of everyone that's been uh, involved. And sometimes when you get this many companies together to design an open standard, it turns into um, everyone taking bits out that they can't do, so you end up with the lowest common denominator. But I'm glad to, to say that that didn't happen with OpenXR. These companies came to the table with their learning experience from their first generation XR APIs, and they have collaboratively built what we're calling a Gen 2 set of APIs for XR, with significant advantages in terms of functionality and performance over the Gen 1 APIs that are currently shipping. It took about six months longer than we originally had hoped, but we think that six months will be worth it because uh, it's a uh, forward-looking uh, design. So what does OpenXR actually give you? It gives you everything you need to code an XR, an augmented reality or virtual reality uh, application in a portable way. So the first thing XR lets you do is interrogate the device you're actually running on. What is the screen resolution? What is the refresh rate? Is it a mono display? Is it a stereo display? Is it transparent? Or are you looking through a camera? It also lets you find all the input sensor devices that you have. You may have a hand controller with buttons. You may be using uh, vision-based control for hands or body. Uh, you can figure all of that out. And then OpenXR lets you get the real-time sensor information, the pose and other sensor inputs, lets you get the pixels that you want to display on the scene and composite everything in very low latency, uh, high performance way. The one thing that OpenXR doesn't have is 3D rendering. So you, you use OpenXR alongside a 3D uh, API. We've used Vulkan here, but you can use it alongside DirectX, OpenGL, no, any 3D API uh, that you wish. And OpenXR provides the parameters across to the 3D pipeline to drive the rendering uh, in a way that fits with the device. So OpenXR has had a lot of support, and we hope it's going to be you know, really useful to the industry. Um, the reason, one reason it does have strong support, it's a win-win-win. It's hard to find anyone who's going to lose uh, through having this standard. The XR vendors, the people making the devices, uh, they're going to win because they are going to get access to a larger library of content. Any application that's coded to OpenXR will run on their hardware. The software developers win because they have to write once and they can run on a much larger range of devices so they get a bigger market. But also end users, and that's the most important thing in the end. The end users will win because they will be much more certain of getting the content that they want on the device that they've just bought. 
the VR and AR industry is kind of in the VHS versus Betamax phase. There's some consumer confusion. You know, if I buy this hardware, will my app run on it or not? And I think OpenXR will help us get into the next phase of the uh, XR market. So OpenXR is a native API. Obviously, XR in the web is key as well. The metaverse is going to be the web after all. So uh, this is the way that native um, VXR apps are created, either directly calling into the low-level APIs like Vulkan or XR, OpenXR, or going through an engine like Unity or Epic. The same thing happens on the website. You have engines like 3JS calling down into uh, the web APIs like WebGL. WebXR is not a Kronos standard, it's a W3C standard. It's bringing uh, OpenXR type functionality up into the web stack. And we're making sure that we're working very closely uh, between OpenXR and WebXR. Uh, our aim is to save WebXR a bunch of work so they can reach a lot of hardware uh, easily. So we're fulfilling our role down at the low level, interfacing into the hardware. Mobile phone vendors uh, are doing awesome work with AR Kit and AR Core, uh, making AR on a mobile phone very accessible. Um, but they are proprietary APIs and on mobile phones only. We're looking forward to OpenXR joining them with some advanced AR functionality, particularly from the uh, head worn uh, AR devices, and bringing that functionality to market in a portable way. The other interesting thing, um, there's some buzz out there on the floor about 5G and how is that, how is that going to affect uh, everyone. Edge servers um, equipped with 5G, um, 5G has the high performance and low latency necessary to send imagery in real time to a lightweight uh, XR uh, device, rendering not in the cloud but on the edge, so the latency can be like, sub 10 milliseconds. And the nice thing is that OpenXR can hide the fact that the pixels are being uh, rendered off device and in an edge server from an application. So your, your OpenXR applications are not just going to be portable across different hardware devices. It's going to be portable across different ways of delivering XR content uh, across the cloud, from the edge, or, or native uh, on device. So that's OpenXR. Fast, moving forward, is Vulkan. There's going to be a whole afternoon on Vulkan. Um, Vulkan continues to get good uh, adoption in the industry. Uh, Vulkan's about three years old now, but it's, it's pretty well everywhere. Every GPU vendor has Vulkan drivers. All the games engines uh, uh, have Vulkan backends. All the platforms, um, desktop, mobile, particularly Android, can, Google continues to be super supportive of uh, Vulkan. Um, some consoles, not PlayStation or Xbox, but Switch does have uh, fully conformant uh, Vulkan drivers. Uh, all the XR devices, the cloud services, the embedded space. And really since GDC, the big, big news has been some of the game streaming services, Stadia from Google, for example, is fully focused around Linux and, and Vulkan. The content is shipping, uh, both on PC. Wolf Wolfenstein Youngblood is the latest title. It is pure uh, Vulcan shipping on PC, but we also have lots of titles on Linux being ported onto Linux platform. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Also, Vulcan on Mac. There's an increasing number of Vulcan applications on Mac. Apple does not have native Vulkan drivers, but we have the open source tools that let uh, developers bring their Vulkan titles onto the Mac and uh, iPhone platforms. We'll talk a little bit more about that too. The last one to ship is Dota Underlords from Valve. Uh, that is a pure Vulkan application. There's no OpenGL uh, backend. So uh, Tom Olson, the chair of Vulkan, will talk in a lot more detail, um, but in fast forward, uh, the way we evolve Vulkan is we come out with a core uh, spec. We have two of them, Vulkan 1.0 and 1.1. Vulkan 1.1 came out in March 2018. Then we build a set of extensions, and we find out which of the extensions are actually popular with the developers, which ones actually get used, you know, which ones have been designed correctly. And the ones that you know, passed those tests 
get built back into the next version of the core release. And that's typically on like an 18 month to 24 month um, life cycle. Uh, there's no written rule. It just it depends on you know, what developers are asking for when it makes sense uh, to do that. You can see some of the um, extensions that are already out there, things like making uh, Vulkan more compatible with HLSL as well as GLSL. Uh, we have lots of interesting roadmap discussions, machine learning, ray tracing, uh, new types of semaphores, which I think a lot of developers will welcome. There'll be a lot more detail on that this afternoon. And because this is uh, SIGGRAPH, not GDC, uh, we're focusing on some of the professional uh, features uh, that we have. Um, we finally have OpenGL class lines. Yes. We go all the way from ray tracing to lines. But for the CAD folks, this is critical. They, they, they need lines for you know, CAD vector drawings uh, in the same style as OpenGL that they've been using for over 20 years. Stipple lines, smooth lines, and Bresenum lines. They're all now uh, in Vulkan. And we're actually finding there's an increasing amount of interest from the CAD and professional authoring community to use Vulkan. Some of the reasons are uh, better performance. If you have you know, a 50 million poly uh, CAD model, very often the bottleneck in that app is on the CPU, not the GPU. It's dispatching the work into the GPU. OpenGL is single-threaded command dispatch. That's the one thing we couldn't fix in OpenGL. Vulkan is multi-threaded command dispatch. So you could have multiple threads dispatching large amounts of work into the GPU uh, in parallel. And this is turning out to be really useful for the CAD people. And the CAD folks, of course, they have large bodies of software written in OpenGL. They're not going to throw those, uh, that, that source away. They need to incrementally bring new functionality uh, into their applications. And one of, one of the areas, of course, is ray tracing, kind of the hot topic here at, at SIGGRAPH. OpenGL is unlikely to get ray tracing. Um, it doesn't fit very well in the kind of the data structures that OpenGL has. And everyone's kind of forward-looking energy is, is now focused on Vulkan. So what people are doing is using the OpenGL to Vulkan interop. Um, so for example, and this is being demonstrated on the show floor, Katia, which is a very well-known uh, CAD package used by uh, many companies throughout the industry, is a OpenGL application. Now they're reaching over through the OpenGL to Vulkan interop that lets you share memory surfaces and synchronize them uh, to do ray tracing using Vulkan ray tracing extensions and then bring that back uh, into their OpenGL application. And I think you'll see a lot of CAD vendors using that incremental uh, transition from OpenGL Vulkan over the next uh, few years. I want to mention Spear and Spear V. Um, it often gets forgotten, even I kind of forget to put it in some of my slide decks, but in many ways it is the most important uh, spec that Kronos does, particularly if you're into, into languages and compilers. Um, and many of these APIs are becoming increasingly programmable, so Spear V gains in importance. Uh, Spear V is an intermediate representation that can carry instructions for both graphics and parallel processing. It's quite a simple format. It's easy to go in and out of, and there's an increasing amount of open source tools surrounding uh, Spear V that let you do uh, interesting things. The most obvious thing with, with Vulkan is to take GLSL, the purple box at the top, go through the open source GL slang compiler, generate your Spear V for Vulkan, or, even, or now OpenCL and OpenGL uh, to execute. But there are some interesting uh, developments. Uh, we've talked about this last year. DXC is Microsoft's HLSL front-end compiler. Uh, working with Microsoft, uh, mainly Google, has been putting in the effort to now have a Spear V backend for DXC. So using the canonical uh, open source Microsoft HLSL compiler, we can generate shaders for uh, Vulkan to execute. So developers now have the choice of GLSL or HLSL for their graphics shaders. There's another open source compiler also driven by uh, Google, which actually takes OpenCLC uh, kernels and compiles that now into uh, Spear V. This is still at the prototype stage, but we'll show some examples in a moment of how this is actually beginning to really enable uh, developers to deploy their OpenCL code in interesting ways. And last but not least, uh, the Spear V cross that lets us go off into metal 
shading language from our Sphere V uh, shaders. And how do we use that? We use that to bring Vulkan programs onto iOS and macOS. There are actually two open source projects uh, using the Vulkan portability work that we're doing at Kronos. The idea is to have a shim that translates your Vulkan calls into uh, metal calls for the Apple platform. And we call out sideways to Spear V cross to cross compile our Spear V into metal shading language, which is put down in through the standard metal compiler chain uh, to execute. We even have a, a Mac-based Vulkan SDK for people that wanting to use uh, Vulkan on Mac and iOS. These implementations are actually pretty complete. We're working hard to make them fully conformant uh, for all of the functionalities there. There are a few bits and pieces that uh, don't fit well over metal. Uh, triangle fans, for example. Uh, no, there's some stencil modes that don't quite work very well. And at, some, at the moment, events are not supported. But I heard this morning that actually we may have fixed that one already. And this is actually being used uh, in production apps. These are the uh, number of production apps that have actually shipped. Uh, the latest one is uh, Dota Underlords that I mentioned uh, before, a pure Vulkan uh, app that ships both on Windows, on Linux, and on Mac, just using the Vulkan API. And back in the day when we had uh, apps with both OpenGL and Vulkan Dota 2, um, we were finding that the um, Vulkan onto Metal was giving about 20 to 50% more performance than Apple's native OpenGL drivers. So you, know, there's, you need to be careful. You don't want to put too many small commands through the shim. Uh, but if you have a well-structured 3D program that is batching your commands, the, the, the uh, performance is actually pretty cool. And we're in a kind of an interesting time where everything is kind of being layered over everything else. And we have uh, things being layered on top of Vulkan, because Vulkan is a nice low-level uh, API. It's actually a pretty good target for bringing in other uh, APIs. We have uh, DXVK, which is a direct X1011 emulator running on top of Vulkan. And you use that with tools like the Wine emulator and the Valve Proton tool. Um, you can actually get DX to run pretty well on top uh, of Vulkan, for example, on Linux. The Vulkan Working Group have put a quite a lot of effort in creating a set of extensions that align DirectX with Vulkan, so these shim layers can actually have quite good performance and uh, not have to do too many gymnastics. This is uh, Tom captured this from the, the Valve website. There are now 507, uh, 5,739 games that have been proven to work through uh, DXVK. And talking about things being layered and being cross-compiled, uh, go back to the example I said earlier, CLSPV. This is deploying OpenCLC on Vulkan. The CLSPV compiler will take your OpenCLC source and compile it for Vulkan uh, Spear V. Uh, Adobe have used this, and this is pu public knowledge. That this is now shipping on the Google uh, App Store. Um, Adobe Premiere Rush is a product that has over 200,000 lines of OpenCLC kernel code. That's a lot of code, and that's detailed, uh, very um, you know, dense code. And they want to ship it on Android. Uh, Android doesn't have OpenCL uh, in the native platform definition, but it does have Vulkan. So this compiler is being used for this production app now doing this cross-compilation, giving the chance for uh, OpenCL code to run in more places. And the OpenCL working group thinks this is awesome, by the way. It's, it's the OpenCL group see this is a, as a plus. Not, this isn't OpenCL and Vulkan fighting. This is Vulkan and compilation technology given, giving OpenCL developers more deployment uh, opportunities. And uh, OpenCL, though, is continuing. It's not being replaced by uh, Vulkan. They're, the two are distinctly different things. Uh, Vulkan is a GPU API. and. Uh, OpenCL is a heterogeneous API. If you want to use multiple CPU cores, multiple GPUs, even FPGAs and DSPs, um, Vulkan won't help you do that. 
uh, but OpenCL uh, has been designed to do uh, exactly that. OpenCL still has more compute flexibility than the GPU APIs, so I think that gap will close, and the OpenCL group is actually trying to help Vulkan you know, fill in some of those gaps, so the CLSPV compiler becomes easier. And uh, there's, um, the OpenCL API tends to be simpler and relatively lightweight um, compared to some of the you know, hardcore uh, GPU APIs like, uh, like Vulkan. We've just done a maintenance release for OpenCL 2.2. A lot of clarifications, bug fixing, uh, better formatting of the specs, better linking into the reference pages. Uh, OpenCL adoption is growing. Um, it was traditionally used in HPC and on the desktop, and on the desktop it's, it's still very strongly uh, deployed. Uh, in the embedded space now, uh, we have lots of libraries, machine learning, compilers, and engines. Uh, you don't realize that OpenCL is being used so widely, but then you read the details, and then we, of course, we output to OpenCL to have harder acceleration. Pretty well everything out there uh, has an OpenCL uh, backend. One of those things is OpenVX, which is uh, Kronos's own vision library. Um, it's uh, basically a API that lets you construct a graph of both vision processing functions, and now also neural network nodes in a, a, a convolutional neural network. And the hardware vendor will take that graph description and optimize it for their hardware. Uh, OpenVX is getting quite wide adoption now. And we have NNEF, which is, it's like Onyx, if you know Onyx, if, for those of you working in the machine learning, where, whereas Onyx is mainly focused on uh, authoring and training uh, interchange between the various frameworks. And then the F is focused on bridging the training domain into the hardware inferencing domain. So if you have small embedded inferencing engines that need to import uh, neural, trained neural networks, they can use uh, NNEF. Uh, and NNEF kind of evolves at the harder rate rather than the, the open source uh, or, uh, training rates. So There's a bit more stability that the hardware guys need. WebGL. So WebGL is still uh, the way to bring graphics into the web, the only way. It's, it really is global. I did this morning, over my cup of first cup of coffee, I clipped the latest uh, numbers so, uh, from my favorite website, Can I Use? So WebGL1 is now 96.43 uh, availability uh, globally. And WebGL2 is catching up. Uh, WebGL2 is actually it's jumped up 10% from the last time I checked, which is a, a month or two ago. 75.92%. Uh, We're just waiting for Safari and Edge to ship. Both Microsoft and Apple have publicly stated that they are going to ship open GL, uh, WebGL2. And once they do, they will be pretty much at the same level as uh, uh, WebGL1. WebGL1 brings mobile class graphics into your web browser. WebGL2 is a big step forward. It brings desktop class graphics into your web browser. Uh, the WebGL working group is working on a bunch of extensions. Um, the big one that everyone's been asking for is parallel shader compilation. So you can offload uh, shader compilation from your main thread so your app doesn't slow down as you're compiling. Uh, multi draw and instance multi draw for batching of commands uh, for much higher performance, particularly if you're dispatching from uh, JavaScript. And compressed texture extensions so we can now support uh, uh, some BC4, BC5, 6, and 7 uh, textures. More extensions in development, WebGL Compute uh, for WebGL2, uh, from a lot of work that's been contributed by uh, Intel, uh, video textures, uh, indexing into your vertex arrays, and all, all of these are going to be demonstrated in just a few minutes by the WebGL uh, folks. GLTF was originally designed to go hand in hand with WebGL, but now it's, it's grown out of just being useful for OpenGL uh, to being useful for uh, the in entire industry. Uh, this is a standard we've been working on for uh, over three years. Uh, the idea was to create a 3D format that was like JPEG for images. Now, you can send a JPEG image to pretty much anyone on the planet, and they will be able to uh, have a device or software that can decode and, and, and display it. And JPEGs are small. 
easy to compact, perfect for sending over uh, a network. Uh, there wasn't a 3D format that gave us that capability for uh, 3D assets. Compact, simple to load, and also describing full scenes. Um, you know, there are many 3D formats out there, some of the traditional ones like OBJ, you know, they're just meshes, just meshes. They don't even have textures, let alone uh, physically based materials. GLTF has a good set of modern capabilities, including PBR, uh, uh, physically based rendered uh, materials. So we can get realistic looking um, models like this. And this is, this is a GLTF model. And this is standard PowerPoint. Uh, this isn't a video. I'm going to do my favorite demo now. The, uh, this is, this is a G GLTF model. So if I break the illusion just for a second, I can go in here and resize this 3D model and uh, rotate it around if I hit the right button. Woo! 3D in PowerPoint. Woo! <laughs> I've joked with these guys before. Finally, I get to use 3D. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. Um, and it's, it's quite cool. You get all the different animations. If you put a 3D model on one slide and in a different size and position on the next slide, it'll do keyframe animations for you. So many hours of uh, 3D playing around. So G GLTF is widely adopted. On the left-hand side here, we, we try to keep track. If you, if you are a tools or application vendor and your logo is not on this slide, please let us know. We would love, love to add you. Uh, on the, right, the left-hand side is all the tools, all the traditional 3D uh, tools. Uh, just notice Cinema 4D has just got GLTF uh, export. That was uh, news I learned yesterday. Um, lots of the scanning apps, lots of tools for optimizing uh, meshes. And on the right-hand side, all the apps and engines uh, that use uh, and import GLTF. Uh, so the games engines like Unity and Unreal, the, the web engines like Babylon and 3.js, uh, the uh, apps and engines for verticals uh, like Cesium is a geospatial uh, app, for example. All the AR and VR apps. We just looked at Office. Facebook supports. You can drop a, a GLTF file into your Facebook feed. Uh, so it, it really is pretty well uh, everywhere. For those of you who haven't come across GLTF before, it's, it's relatively simple by, by design. It's a JSON file that describes the scene, and then there's a binary payload for the geometry and the animations and, and the skins. And the textures can either be PNGs, JPEGs, or soon KTX2, which is a container format from Kronos. We'll talk about that in a second. And you can use the textures either as you know, straight colors, or you can feed them into uh, the PBR system, which has mandatory metallic roughness or optional specular glossiness. These are models that have been well, well used and quite familiar to, to the industry. So we, as we evolve the um, GLTF ecosystem, we have these kind of three tracks. We need tools, because you need to be able to generate GLTF file easily from your favorite tool, ideally. And we're, we're getting there. You can see the number of tools that now have GLTF export. Um, we're particularly proud of working with Blender, the 280 release of Blender. Uh, we have contributed some project and funding to make sure they have full GLTF import and export. Um, we need to have everyone using GLTF cons consistently, else you can't exchange easily. So we've put a lot of uh, investment into validation tools, uh, into um, uh, a reference viewer. So there's a ground truth out there if you want to be uh, consistent with the normal way of rendering. And a large model farm. So if you're building an importer, uh, if you can import all the models that we supply in open source, you know, you, you're doing a pretty good job. And then, then, of course, functionality. Um, we had to be careful not to put too much functionality in too fast, because uh, we don't want to run ahead of what the industry can cope with. Uh, but of course, there is always the need for new functionality. We've had the Draco extension for mesh compression has been out there for about just over a year. And the engines now are beginning to pick it up. Uh, Adobe Dimension Blender, uh, Babylon, and 3JS, and gives you like a 15 to 25 times uh, mesh compression ratio, typically. So say, we're particularly proud of uh, our work with the uh, uh, Blender guys. Uh, 280 has uh, full import and export of GLTF. The export, you can turn on optional Draco uh, mesh compression. 
and we in particular have taken care to take the Blender uh, internal physically based uh, shader node maps and they map nicely onto the GLTF's uh, PBR uh, materials. Universal textures is the next thing uh, that we're really working hard on uh, to deliver so we can compress uh, textures, um, meshes, but now we want to have better handling of compressed textures. You can send a JPEG, but to handle JPEG on a local device, you have to unpack the whole thing, which can get quite big, and then you have to recompress it again if you want to have GPU accelerated uh, textures. Uh, using some technology donated by a company called Binomial in Seattle, uh, called Basis, uh, we can actually compress our images uh, using the Basis technology to create uh, a universal texture that can be decompressed on the fly directly into GPU compressed textures, supporting quite a wide range. So there's almost certainly going to be a compressed texture format that you can decompress to on the fly on your, on your device. Uh, so you only need to send one uh, set of textures uh, across the network. It's going to be very small JPEG size, but you get much better out unpacking into your GPU. And we're going to be using KTX2 as the container format for those super compressed uh, textures. Uh, KTX2 is a cool format that, that Kronos has defined. It's well understood by OpenGL and uh, Vulkan. It gives you nice streaming support, random access into your MIP levels, etc. So we think this is a good, good combination. The, we have some engines already uh, with prototype support. Uh, we haven't completed the, the spec yet. We're very interested in feedback. There's the, the um, design discussions there at the top link. Uh, but we have these engines, uh, Babylon again, three .js, Cesium, UX3D, uh, that now have uh, support for uh, these universal textures. That experience is what we need to make sure we're doing the right thing before we do the final bake uh, on the extension. So let us know if you think we're doing the right thing. The other big thing that on, the, um, on the roadmap list, and this is um, in large part coming from the 3D commerce initiative that we'll talk about in just a moment, is next generation PBR. Uh, we have you know, uh, companies wanting to show uh, products to sell uh, on the web, you know, a, a vase with nice uh, lacquer. Uh, we need things like absorption, attenuation, clear coat, subsurface scattering, uh, which we don't currently have in GLTF. Uh, we've been working on a way to bring this in, in a backwards compatible way. Uh, we want to have this more advanced functionality defined in the spec, but if your device doesn't support it, it falls back to the existing functionality in a clean way. And we've, we're very fortunate, Dassault uh, systems have donated uh, as a te technology contribution to GLTF, uh, their PBR uh, technology. And we have a lot of participation from Google and Microsoft, the Babylon team, uh, the NVIDIA MDL team, uh, Otoy, you know, very high-end renderers. Uh, we think we can create a PBR model that will work for everyone and uh, go into all of these different uh, systems in a nice, clean way. Um, so. Uh, again, we're working on this pretty much in the open, so now come and give us your, uh, your feedback. Other topics, animation, you know, levels of detail and streaming is an obvious one. Uh, point clouds is another really important one, uh, particularly for scanning and uh, automotive type um, applications. Um, cross asset linking and compositing multiple models in a single scene, uh, enhanced metadata. So lots of interesting stuff to do. Uh, the GLTF working group is very busy, and they've just got busier because uh, 3D Commerce um, is the new working group I mentioned back right at the beginning uh, that we've just created on Friday, and we announced here at SIGGRAPH on Monday. And anyone is very welcome uh, to join. So it, we've it's the 3D Commerce Working Group, but what does that mean? Well, there's an opportunity out there. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen um, you know, uh, demos and apps, small apps from the re uh, resellers and retailers uh, that use augmented reality. Perhaps one of the best known ones is from IKEA. Um, I'm sure some people have seen, you can take 
items from the IKEA catalog, like a, a chair or a table, and drop it in using augmented reality into your own front room and see if it fits, see if it uh, you know, uh, suits your decor. Um, I was looking on the web, and I was, I, I was surprised. The first mention I could find of that was in August 2013. That's almost six years ago. It is six years ago. So the problem has been not the technology per se, it's been scaling it up to an industrial scale. And what kind of problems you know, are people facing? The turns out that many of these retailers have millions of SKUs, and they're they don't get 3D models out of the manufacturing process. They're having to scan them in. Um, they can't scan them in fast enough. Some of these retailers have warehouses around the country scanning 24 hours a day, and they're still being overwhelmed. Wouldn't it be cool if the CAD tools actually were to generate the right data that the e-commerce pipeline um, uh, would actually use? Uh, the retailers want to start using these virtual products for photo shoots rather than having to stage um, the physical uh, products you know, in, uh, for physical photo shoots, something that the automotive industry has been doing for decades. Um, but again, they need the, the high quality photorealistic uh, 3D models to make that um, uh, possible. If you have literally millions of products flowing through uh, this, this pipeline, Currently, everyone is defining all their metadata, all their configuration data in different ways. The sizes, the colors, everything is like handcrafted. If you're building a website that's trying to display these products for sale, you have to hand touch uh, pretty much every uh, product that goes out there. Trivial things like which way is up. You now, these models come in with different orientations. You don't know which way is up, and you, things come in upside down and back to front, which isn't the ideal selling uh, re representation. And last but not least, how can we get um, consistency of display? Now, if your green vase looks blue on the website or on your mobile phone, you're going to get a lot of returns, and that's bad. So, how do we, you know, how do we solve all of this? Well, the, a group of uh, retailers and technology companies, including Google, Wayfair, Ikea, Target, and others, in the end, it was like 20 companies, um, started dis discussing at the end of last year that, that we could do something, and they were looking for a home for this initiative, so they came to Kronos. Kronos, we have a, a new initiative process, so we set up an exploratory group, which is open to anyone who just wants to sign an NDA, no cost uh, to get involved, and that group has a single purpose, to discuss, can we agree on what the problems are, and can we agree on that we could do something useful if we were to work together? And the result was 70 companies, which is a lot, 70 companies coming together in this exploratory group, uh, a good mix of both technology companies and uh, the retail uh, companies. And uh, they met for about three months, and they quickly came to the conclusion that um, there was definitely things that we could do if we were to cooperate. And so Kronos, as of Friday, has uh, voted to establish uh, a working group. So we're actually going to start executing on this uh, scope of work. Some of the things that the group is uh, considering, you know, guidelines for the tools, encouraging and working with the tools vendors to get the right data out at the very you know, start of the process, um, structuring the me metadata through you know, guidelines and standards so everyone can use the data consistently as it goes through uh, the pipeline, and working on the visual display you know, problems and opportunities that we have uh, on different uh, devices and platforms. So, if this is of interest, now now's a great time uh, to get involved. Um, as the working group starts, you do have to be a Kronos member, um, but you know, we welcome anyone who wants to participate. And you know, we're looking forward to, you know, the working group is not limited to just use Kronos technologies, of course, but there are a lot of Kronos activities, I think, that will help inform and synergize with the 3D commerce uh, activities like GLTF and WebGL, obviously, but also OpenXR and Vulkan. Now, even OpenVX for uh, photogrammetry, vision acceleration, machine learning acceleration, as people are trying to you know, scan and understand uh, objects in an AR environment. So that was it. Oh, I'm gone, I'm almost on time. So that was, whew. I'm exhausted, I don't know about you, um, but that, hopefully that was, uh, that was useful for you. Um, so we're 
now going to launch into um, a series of boss starting at 10 in around 15 minutes. Um, we're going to start with, uh, is that right? GLTF is the next one. Right. Um, as I say, all these slides are going to be posted in the next one or two days. Um, so I welcome the GLTF guys. If you want to come and start getting plugged in, I, I can take any questions whilst you're doing that. So, uh, any questions? Presentation. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, hang around for GLTF and WebGL, and uh, come back at 5:30 for the party. Thanks, everyone.